Okay, so I, I'd like to thank the organizers for the option, invitation to speak. So this is the first time I joined the GI community conference. And I've learned a lot from the talks so far. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is a joint work with my collaborator, Shuang Miao and Saurabh Shashani. So Shuang Miao is currently in China, uh, a professor in Wuhan University. Saurabh Shashani is a, at UMass Amherst. Okay. okay, so this is the outline of the talk. So I will first introduce the ideal fluids in relativistic framework. And then I will go to discuss the problem we are going to deal with, which is a hard phase bottle with free boundary. And then I will talk about the ideas. So the main result is we obtained a local in time well poseness for the free boundary problem. And also uh, we can pass to the Newtonian limit, okay, when the speed of light go to infinity. So the main idea, so I will draw comparison with the Newtonian problem and uh, discuss a few ideas on how to obtain the a priori estimates. Okay. And okay, so that's the plan. Okay, so so we let this is the Minkowski speed space time, right? So that's the standard notation. Okay, so this is a metric. Okay. And uh, and normal, so using the standard notation, so M alpha beta corresponding to M and the raised indices corresponding to M inverse. Okay. Okay, so now to describe the relative fluid, we need a few the physical quantities. Okay, so the motion we know is described the fluid velocity and the several thermodynamical quantities. So the fluid uh, velocity is a future directed. So it means it's positive, right? The time component is positive and unit time like four vector. So unit time like, so it's like this, okay. Okay. And we also have uh, the following thermodynamic quantities. So N is the number density of particles and P is the pressure and rho is energy density, S is entropy, theta is temperature. And we know the law of thermodynamics says that, well, the pressure and the energy density should be functions of the N and S, okay? And they both has to be non-active and it's related by these two equations, okay? And the sound speed is defined by the following, okay? And we here, we normalize the units so that the speed of light is one. So the speed of light is one, the, the speed of sound speed should be no more than one, okay? Okay. Okay, so we know the fluid should satisfy the following conservation laws. So these two conserve, so the T is the energy momentum tensor and the here I, I is the particle current, okay? And given by these two formula. So this gradient, so I normally just call it gradient. So actually it should be the canonical levi civita connection. Okay, so if I say gradient by mistake, you, you understand me, it's a connection. Okay. okay. Okay, so now assume that the fluid is barotropic, that, that this means that the pressure is a function of the density, energy density, okay. And in particular, if we assume this function f is strictly increasing, and suppose we, so in this case, we can solve rho in terms of p, right? So rho can be solved in terms of p, and we, do, we can define this function. So assume that this integral exists, okay, and it's finite. And then we just elongate the fluid velocity by multiply e to the f. So f is here, okay. So precisely because u is a unit vector and this new vector v should be just have length given by this and the length is e to the f, okay. Then we know that actually the, under these reductions, the equation becomes, the equation of motion becomes the following, okay. So the first is the equation for the uh, momentum and this is the number particle, uh, okay conservation of number of particles, okay. So here, G, we know rho and the rho, both rho and the P are functions of the length V, right? Because length of V actually is E to the F, okay? So, and F is defined by this, okay? 
Okay, and this production was made, well, at least for example, in a paper by Chris Duderu in 1995 in AMA. Okay, so I'm not going to discuss how this is, how this reduction is done. Okay, okay. And now we actually will make a few additional assumptions. So we assume that the fluid is irrotational. Okay, so this means that there is a potential function phi, scalar function phi, so that V can be written as the covariant derivative phi. Okay, and then we also assume the speed of sound speed is one. Okay, so in other words, the sound speed equal to the speed of light. So this is a situation which the fluid is incompressible or stiff, right? So, and in this case, P and the rho just are given by these two, okay? And this quantity G is always equal to one and the energy momentum tensor is by this, is satisfy this formula and the number currents is this one. Okay, so in this case, so the lens V precisely is the enthalpy, okay? Now, uh, Sijun, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Is it important for you that P equals rho or you could stick in different uh, equations? No, P doesn't equal to rho. P doesn't equal to rho. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what so, is the uh, what is the meaning of the of the stiff? Uh, sorry, uh, stiff this is uh, this is just uh, I think this is a, a type of fluids. <laughs> There's uh, so many experts in GR, you know, <laughs> studied by in the GR community. Okay, so precisely that's just a terminology where in the case, the speed of sound, because sound speed equal to but when I see, but when rho is big, P is uh, to the leading order like rho, right? At, at large densities. I'm not so sure because you know this, there's also another quantity lens of V involved or the enthalpy. So P equal to half of enthalpy square minus one and rho equal to half enthalpy square plus one. Okay. So you are talking, you are thinking about compressible fluid. So I'm talking about incompressible. I see, that's a difference. Okay. Okay, so I, I, I will explain later. So let me, it's okay, I move on. Okay, okay. So, so this is, actually this reduction was done by Chris Duderu also in the same paper. Okay, so what I'm going to, I'm talking about uh, is nothing new so far, okay. So the, the energy, the, the equation for momentum and uh, conservation of uh, number density, and uh, sorry, number particles are given by these two equations. And in particular, if the fluid is irrotational, okay, and incompressible, then in fact, P and the row are related by these, okay? And this is uh, momentum, energy momentum tensor, and this is number current. Okay, then in this case, the hard phase fluid equation is, is hard phase fluid equation. In fact, here I'm not using incompressible, uh, sorry, irrotational here, okay? So this is just, uh, this is the momentum equation and uh, conservation of a number of particles, okay? Become these two equations. And these, these two equations seems a lot simpler, right? Okay. Okay, so now what is the precise uh, problem we want to study? So we, we want to study the free boundary problem, okay? So in other words, say, assuming that initially you have a bulk of fluid, say, given by at initial time, okay? So the initial time slice, say, sigma zero, okay? So omega zero, sorry. So this omega t is a time slice at time t, okay? So initial data is given by at omega zero, okay? So assume that you have a bulk of fluid here, okay? So this is omega zero. And outside this bulk of fluid, it's vacuum, okay? And then you want to let the fluid evolute, okay? So there is then, it evolute like this, right? And then, and this part of boundary is unknown, okay? So this boundary, d omega, we use d omega to indicate the so, timeline boundary. Uh, sorry, Sijiu, so are you defining incompressible fluid to be the one with the, which is stiff? Is that your definition of incompressible? That's right, that's right. Stiff, 
Okay, so that's the definition. Okay. Yeah, that's just a definition. It's just yeah, a, but right. yeah. So your your pressure as a function of rho is an affine function of rho. It's essentially rho plus some constant or something like that. I won't say that either. Or minus p is another, is, are, no, it's not because mm -hmm. you, p and the rho both are functions of v. That's it. Right. Yeah, and then it, I mean they are they are that's they are right. related. But you don't know, right? It, it, it all depends on what is the length of v square. Uh, it all depends on what is the answer p here. So this answer p here. I see. Thank you. Okay. So, so the answer p is unknown. So we we don't have. We are not going to talk about the pressure and the density, energy density anymore. So we are going to have the answer p in the equation. Okay. 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 So now, so the so free boundary problem will have free boundaries, right? So these, these, so this is, so we want given initial data. So given initial bulk of fluid, we want to see how it evolutes, right? So this, this time-like boundary, d omega is part of the unknown, okay? So d omega is part of the unknown, okay? And now the free boundary problem is the following, okay? So let me just erase this graph, okay? So the free boundary is a problem is the following, okay? So the, this is a, this, the first two equations describes the, uh, describes the, the, this is a, you know, conservation, two conservation laws, a momentum equation, okay. This is a momentum equation, satisfy momentum equation inside the uh, domain, okay, through domain. And this is incompressible, right? And this is irrotational, okay, so we just, this is the exterior derivative and the, of the one form B. So we just abuse the notation, okay. Okay. And now, well, it's a physically assumption that sigma, sigma, the answer P should be inside the domain should be greater than what's on the boundary, right? So this is equivalent to the pressure should be positive inside the fluid domain, okay? Because the pressure equals half of sigma squared minus one, okay? And the pressure equal to zero on the boundary. And the last assumption is the fluid particle on the boundary will remain on the boundary. So in other words, if the particle initially at the boundary, then it will just stay on the boundary for the later time, okay? Okay, so V is tangent to the boundary of the fluid domain, okay? And this condition here is the so-called uh, relativistic uh, Taylor sign condition. So I will, we will dis I will discuss the importance of this condition later. Okay. So now this is uh, uh, only assumed on the initial time slice. Okay. So of course this is stronger than just sigma square being positive inside domain because it also requires actually the normal inward normal derivative is positive. Okay. So the main result is for any given uh, sufficiently smooth, smooth uh, sublift data. So precisely sublift data. Okay, and there is a unique solution for a finite time period. Okay, and the equation is locally well posed. In other words, okay, and the data the, there's no restriction other than it has to be a sublift data. So the data, the data can be arbitrary, arbitrary large. Okay, so I have just mentioned that we need. Uh, relativistic, relativistic Taylor sign condition at initial time, okay. And here we don't uh, try to lower the regularity here, okay. So we don't, we are not interested in getting the optimal regularity, okay. Okay, so here, so why are we interested in this model, right? So first, this is uh, commonly known in the GR community. So please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. This is a model used to, it's a simplified model for a neutron star. Okay. So because in the case of a neutron star, the sound speed is considered very, uh, very close to the speed of light. So this is a simplified model to describe the motion of a neutron star. Okay. And now why, do we actually assume it's incompressible irrotational? In fact, we don't really need to assume that, okay? So we can deal with arbitrary barotropic fluid 
and with non-zero vorticity. Okay, it doesn't have to be in a rotational. It doesn't have to be incompressible. Actually, the method we developed uh, really applied to the most general situation. And the reason is that we, we started working on this model because we don't really want to be bothered with unnecessary complexity of the, uh, the model. Right? So we want to really see what's really the main issue here. And so the half phase model is suffices to capture the main difficulty. Okay. And in fact, the hard based model, uh, after our work, we realized it actually captured the main difficulty of a class of free boundary problem, uh, just beyond these, the model or the general barotropic fluids uh, with um, Minkowski background. Okay, so we can, for example, we can also study the free boundary problem of compressible fluid using the same idea. Okay, so we will see why this is the case. Okay, so I'm going to explain this. So here are some his historical results. Okay, so for gastros models. Okay, so I, so for gastro models. So we know that Makino Randall obtained the existence for a class of solutions, and uh, Mahir, okay, Koten uh, scholar and Spack, and the Juhi Jan uh, Laflog Masmudi, they independently obtained appropriately a priori estimates for the gastro model. And the Trickening obtained existence using a Nash model scheme. Okay, so what we are discussing here, so the model I'm discussing today is the so-called liquid model. Okay, it's not the gastrous model. Okay, so for this model, and we know that Olenek in a series of paper studied existence of a similar model using very different methods. So here, and also in 2019, Ginsburg obtained a priori estimate for this model. So the Ginsburg's work is the closest to ours in which he obtained a priori estimate, but with smallness assumptions on the initial data. So his smallness assumption basically says that this is a case which is a perturbation of the Newtonian fluid, okay? So here, uh, our result, we have appropriate estimate and well postness, and we have no size restrictions on the initial data. So now let me mention also following our work, there's a new recent result by uh, Disconsi, Ifrin, and Tataru for the gastro model. Okay. okay, so now let's just go back to the question of how to solve the problem. <clears throat> so we know that this is a free boundary problem. Right? And it's a, a lot of nonlinearity in it. It's free boundary. We don't really know how to solve it, but we, we do have quite a bit of experience with the Newtonian problem. Okay. So the Newtonian problem here is that, so the Newtonian problem is, I mean, it's clo very closely related to the so-called the water wave problem, right? So the first equation is a momentum equation, right? So the incompressible Euler, okay. And we have also, a fluid domain that is with boundary, the domain change with respect to time, right? So we have omega t here. And also that typically it's assumed it's incompressible, irrotational, okay? And the pressure equal to zero on the boundary, okay? And uh, also the last assumption is, so, of, so this v tilde is three-dimensional, right? So one v tilde is tangent to the free bound, free boundary. So in other words, the particle on the boundary at the initial time remain on the boundary at later time, okay? And we can see that this seemed to be quite, quite similar to the model we have just discussed, right? So just I just come back to here, okay? So that's the equation we want. So this is like, this is oil equation, momentum equation, incompressible rotational and the pressure. So imagine this is a pressure equal to zero on the boundary and greater than zero, sigma minus one, right? Equal to zero on the boundary, positive inside, okay. Okay, so now for the Newtonian problem, in fact, the taylor sun condition always holds by a simple maximum principle, right? So if we apply divergence to both sides of this equation, the first equation, and you will get that Laplace P equal to minus 
gradient v square, and uh, which is no more than zero. Okay. So now this means that the pressure looks like concave down, right? So this is a fluid domain. So of course the inward normal should be strictly positive. So precisely we are ap applying the hub maximum principle. Okay. okay, so it's strictly positive and greater than a positive constant. Okay, okay, so now there is a long history in the solution of the Newtonian problem, okay. So now because the fluid is incompressible and irrotational, we know that the velocity field satisfies the Laplace equation. So this is a classical method in the fruit, uh, water wave community or the in, uh, Newtonian fruit, uh, in, uh, ero, uh, uh, potential fluid community is to just reduce the problem to the boundary, okay? Because if we know the velocity field on the boundary, then we can just use the Laplace equation to recover everything inside the fluid domain, okay? Now, the second uh, idea, which is crucial to, to the later development was that this is contained in this work uh, we, we did in 1999, okay? It shows that just by taking a material derivative to the momentum equation, we actually will get a quasi-linear equation, okay? So this is a quasi-linear equation with the left-hand side uh, consists of the higher order terms and it's of hyperbolic type. So I'm going to show you why this is a quasi-linear equation and where does this come from? Okay, so next. Okay, so let me just uh, do it right now. Okay, okay, okay. So remember this is, a, so I'm not going to write uh, uh, tilde. Okay, so this is, a, and dt is just like the material derivative. Okay, v dot gradient, okay. And dtv plus gradient p equal to zero, okay. Is the, is, the, is the oil equation, right? The fluid equation. So applying one more material there to the equation, right? So we get the following, okay? So here I'm going to introduce notation commutator, right? So dt gradient is precisely dt gradient minus gradient dt, okay? So plus, so I just put a commutator here, okay? So then of course we have to look at gradient dt p equals zero, okay. Okay, so now what is the commutator? So I'm going to just calculate dt commutator. So this, this gradient, so each component, let's say dip, okay. So dt is dt plus v dot gradient, okay, dip. And now the, the only turn left is div dot gradient p, right. But now our fluid is, Irrotational, so we can write this as grade, minus gradient p dot gradient of vi. Okay, okay. So now the equation. I so if I this is the one of the components, right? So I can just write the equation as dt square v. Okay, minus gradient p dot gradient v. Okay, so this dot is here equal to minus gradient dp, dtp. So we know that the pressure equal to zero on the boundary, right? This is a fluid domain, okay? Pressure equal to zero on the boundary. So the gradient P, sorry. Okay. So the gradient P should point in the normal direction, okay? Gradient P, okay? Should point in the normal direction, okay? So the gradient P, we just write gradient P, we name gradient P equal to A, minus gradient P equals to a n, okay? So n is the unit normal, okay? So a, so of course, if it's only in the normal direction, so we can just really, so, so we decompose gradient P in the tangential normal direction and only the normal direction survive. So this a precisely just equal to negative dp dn times normal, okay? So this is normal, okay? So then the, the equation we can just write the tv square, and um, plus, so gradient P we plug in, right? So minus gradient P plus A, and this is normal dot gradient. So this is a Dirichlet to Neumann operator equal to minus gradient DTP, okay? So this is uh, exactly this equation I'm talking about, right? The, this equation, okay? Okay, 
this equation. Okay, so this is, I have just derived this equation for you. Okay, so now let me explain why this is uh, 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 sorry, hyperbolic type quasi-linear equation with the right, left-hand side as high order. Okay, so in the in the message in this paper of twenty years ago, in fact, because all the quantities essentially satisfy some ellipt elliptic type equation like Laplace of this quantity equal to something, and we can express all the the quantity A and the quantity gradient dp, dtp as boundary values, uh, bound, using boundary integrals to express these terms. And we find that they are of lower order, okay? And since they are lower order, and then let me also explain, and since, so these two, we, we in, the, in my work, we show that these two are lower order, okay? So now here, I also, Precisely want to explain so why this is also uh, these two lower orders. So this is already already quasi-linear. So here now I want to say that why I say this is a of hyperbolic type. Okay. So precisely, so this is so we already know A is positive, right? Because this is A. Okay. So we already know A equal to minus dpdn, which has a positive lower bound. Okay. okay. So now what is gradient n, uh, the Dirichlet normal of the gradient nv is really dv dn, right? So nv satisfies the, the, the Laplace equation, okay? So we know that if I multiply v with dv dn, so of course, if this is just a, maybe I should really just write to you, okay? So one of the component of v, okay? ds on the boundary, we know we can use the green identity to show that this is gradient v square dx and which is strictly positive. So now this means that this is a positive operator. Okay. So this is a positive operator. Then this is just a hyperbolic type of equation, right? Because remember what is a hyperbolic type equation? Hyperbolic type dt square v, right? It's positive. So I can roughly think this looks like this. Okay, so of course this is how not how we solve it, but we know negative Laplace is a positive operator. So analogly, we can just think that the left hand side looks like this. Okay, equals to a lower order term. Okay, lower order term. Okay, so this is why I say this is of hyperbolic type. And of course, if we know it's hyperbolic type, if we know A is lower order and the right-hand side lower order, then you can just use the standard energy estimate to find a, a priori estimate, keep taking derivative and get uh, uh, local well closeness. Okay, solve the equation, okay. Okay, so that's the approach we had 20 years ago, okay. And now this, the other work given important work there's a, this work given in, given by Christodor Lindbergh. Okay, so they have they they consider the case where the vorticity is not zero. So now, expressing things in terms of boundary integral becomes tedious, right? So at least very tedious. So instead of using boundary integrals, they actually just really de derive the equations for the quantities involved. So precisely, you just apply, say, divergence to the equation and then taking material derivative, apply divergence again. Okay, so it's easy to derive. You will find the Laplace of P sets by this equation and P equals zero on the boundary. And because P equal to zero on the boundary at the initial time and the particle remain uh, on the particle, uh, on the boundary remain on the particle, so the material derivative of uh, P is also zero on the boundary. So these two equations, okay. So now if you look at these two equations, it's quite easy to explain why directly, why this is, this is a low order term, this is a low order term. So let me just do it, right? So we know this is a quasi-linear equation already. So simply you can just use elliptic estimates, okay, to obtain the, uh, to, to conclude these are low order term because you can see that say A, 
So if A is, remember A is an active DPDN, right? So A is an active DPDN, okay? So this, this, this means that we need to estimate what's, uh, uh, what's a regularity of gradient P. So, but if, if Laplace P has a regularity equivalent to the derivative of V, then the gradient P should have a derivative equivalent to V, right? So if you have a, if, so gradient P should have, sorry, gradient P should have regularity equivalent to V, okay? And also looking at, so the, of course, the left-hand side of the equation already controls gradient of V. So of course, that's a lower order, okay? And also Laplace of DTP have the regularity like gradient of V or two derivative of P. So gradient of DTP, DTP should be like V or dV and which is like V, right? But of course, I'm, I actually make uh, it a little bit easier than it should be. So in fact, it also involves the boundary of the domain, okay? But anyway, they are lower order terms, okay? By just using elliptic estimates, okay? Okay, so now what is truly difficult in their approach or actually is the following. So if we, we reduce to the boundary integral and to solve the equation on the boundary, then we know that in order to get energy estimate or a priori estimate, we have to take derivatives, right? So it's quite natural if you have in uh, just working on the equation on the boundary, you just take spatial derivative is equivalent to the tangential derivative to the boundary, okay? But if you work in the inside the fluid domain and you take spatial derivative, okay? So this is your fluid domain. So that if the equation is inside the fluid domain and you take spatial derivative, that will destroy the boundary data, right? So in fact, all the quantities, when you take spatial derivative, the boundary, you, you don't really know what happened, what is the boundary value of these quantities. So there's a lot of technicalities involved in the approach of crystal Limbra. Okay, so for the higher order and energy, they still take, they do take spatial derivative, but they have to resolve the issue of the uh, technicality involved, okay. So they, they obtain, so Chris Dudo Limbra obtained a priori estimate, and in the work of Limbra, okay, five years later, he used nash moser scheme to obtain existence, okay. Okay, so now let's go back to our problem. Okay, so, so for our problem, so then of course, naturally we want to do similar things, right? So remember, this is our momentum equation, okay? This is our momentum equation, looks very much like the Euler equation for the water waves, right? So we take a material derivative, the dV derivative in fact, so we call this material derivative, so, okay? So dV is this, this, uh, this derivative, okay? And we do the same thing, we will get this equation, okay? So this is a commutator and performing the similar type of uh, computation, you will get, this is like a uh, Dirichlet to normal operator. But the, what's the difference is here, this is a hyperbolic Dirichlet to normal operator, okay? And also because the pressure, sorry, it's not a pressure, the enthalpy square equals to one on the boundary. So the, the connection, the, the, the the covariant derivative of sigma square points in the normal direction. So similarly, we can just write it as only as a A times a normal component only, right? So here we have to make assumption that the relativistic Taylor sign condition holds. Okay, so this is a, the relativistic Taylor sign condition. Okay. okay, so now the, the equation after taking a uh, dV material derivative is reduced to something very similar to the Newtonian case, except that the following, okay. So this operator is the hyperbolic Dirichlet normal operator. The being hyperbolic means that the, 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 the velocity field don't solve the Laplace equation. Instead, it solves the box equation, okay. So dollar version here, this is D, it, box is a dollar version. Okay, so wave equation, okay, okay. And similarly, we can just derive equation for sigma square and dv sigma square. It satisfies these equations. And okay, so now, but the question is, because 
the velocity field and all the other quantities satisfies the box equation, the wave equation instead of the plus equation. So we don't have the elliptic estimate to rely on to solve the problem, right? To, to tell us whether this is a lower term, this is a lower order term. And we also don't have the, you, you know, like the elliptic case, uh, we can use Green's identities to say that the derision to normal operator is positive. And the hyperbolic one, it's not very clear. It is still positive okay, because it's a hyperbolic. Okay. So the question is whether the hyperbolic addition normal operator is positive. Okay. And whether these are of lower order terms. And the main idea is how the question is really how to get the a priori estimate. Okay. Okay. So this, these are the main ingredients involved in the proof. So we have to show, in fact, we are able to show the hyperbolic Dirichlet to normal map is still positive, okay? And the coefficient A and the right-hand side are also of lower order, okay? So this is uh, quite surprising to us, okay? And now for higher order, so of course, to obtain a priori estimate, we have to take higher order derivatives, right? So now instead of taking spatial derivative, we know it, it's, it's complex, okay? We actually just apply the material derivative, okay? The reason to apply material derivative is simple, right? Because we know that the free particle on the boundary remain on the boundary. So that means, and we also know the enthalpy equals to one at, for all time. So if you take on the, on the boundary, the enthalpy equal to one on the boundary. So if you take the material derivative, right? So on the boundary that the, all the material derivative equal to zero on the boundary. So this boundary value is naturally given for all the higher order derivatives, okay? And of course we can derive the equations for dv, k, k times dv derivative of sigma square, okay? Okay. And then, of, so after getting all, applying these derivatives, but we still need to know, control the spatial derivative, right? So because the reason to uh, take further derivatives is because we want to use sobolev embedding. And to use sobolev embedding, we need to know the spatial regularities. So how to control the spatial derivatives? We use the equation to show that two material derivative equal to one spatial derivative. So why is this? Okay, so you, you for the moment, I just like you to believe me that the right, ha right hand side is lower order. So if the right hand side is lower order and A, you also, so, so A is lower order, then the equation clearly says two material derivative equal to one spatial derivative, right? Okay. Okay, so now, of course, so how do we recover the estimates of why, why, no, why, why the right hand, right hand side and A are of lower order? So of course, one of the idea, okay, so this is not the whole idea, okay? One of the idea is, well, we cannot really, we don't have elliptic estimates for the box equation, right? But if two material derivative equal to one spatial derivative, that means that box, remember box is dt squared minus Laplace, right? So dt squares is approximately like dv squared. So it's dt squares like dv squared plus some lower order term, okay? So then the box actually equal to elliptic operator plus some lower order term because dv square is just like dx, okay? Now we can, so this is one of the ingredients involved is that we can use elliptic estimates also, okay? But this is not everything involved, okay? Now, so with this, we obtain the a priori estimate. So in fact, the, this strategy also works when, a pro when constructing approximate solution. So to, to, solve, to show the solution exists and is unique, we use the Galaki method, okay? So we discretize equation and, and, to show, and uh, into a sequence of ODE equations. And we show that the approximate sequence, in fact, also a similar idea in the decomposition, we use uh, the Galaki decomposition, we used a base similar estimates as original equation. And then they have, they are uniformly controlled, then we can just pass to the limit, okay? And show the solution exists, okay? And uniqueness is, uh, you know, because we, we are dealing with quite a lot, a bit of 
uh, regularity here, so uniqueness is routine. Okay. Okay. So the main idea. So why the hyperbolic Dirichlet Neumann operator is positive. Okay. So here, first, I'm going to show why the uh, Dirichlet Neumann map is positive. Okay. So of course, if you believe me, right? So of course, we have to start with somewhere, right? So if you believe this is a hyperbolic equation, uh, is is a Quasi-linear. So, if this is a quasi-linear equation with the Lepin's hard side of consisting of higher order terms, then a natural method energy estimate is is just multiply this equation by dvv, right? So this is like if you have dt square minus Laplace u equals zero, then you apply dt u to the equation, right? So you apply the dvv to both this boundary equation and also this control equation, box V equals zero, okay? And integrate respectively. So for the second one, you integrate on the whole domain and the first one just on the boundary. And it turns out we can obtain control of the following positive energy. So the first one is the time slice uh, in, in the whole full domain of both the dt derivative, a space and the time derivative of V, okay? And the second one is this. So here is where this the, the sign of A is so important, the positive sign. A, we assume initially it's positive, right? So it remained positive for a short period of time, okay? Okay. And the second one is also positive, okay, quantity, okay? So I'm just going to use a model equation to, to show you that's the case, okay? So remember the first equation is dv squared plus uh, positive quantity times normal derivative to be, okay? And the bound on the fluid boundary. So, so here we just simplify the case. We assume the, the domain is just the ball, okay? The union ball, okay? B is a union ball. So this is, is the boundary equation, right? Two time derivative plus one normal derivative. Dr is the radial derivative is a normal derivative if the domain is B, okay? And the second equation is box u equals zero, but let's just say box u equal to f. Half is little f are uh, lower order terms. Okay, little f, big f, lower order terms. Okay, so now, so as I said, as if this is a quasi-linear equation, you want to multiply dt u to the first equation, right? So we also we multiply dt u to both first and the second equation, and performing the usual trick, right? So write it as as conserve conserve forms. So dt u times dt square u is half dt u, half, half of dt of dt u square. And the second term is just a simple mu multiplication. Okay. And here you also write the second equation into a conser conservation forms, okay, conservation forms of conservation laws. Okay. So it's just this one. Okay. Okay, then we integrate the second equation on the whole domain, right? So use the, then we use the divergence theorem, okay, or the just fundamental theorem of calculus, right? So the first term here, so the first term here, this term yields the, 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 the this top integral, right? Minus the, the, the integral on the top slice and minus the integral on the bottom. And this one, okay, give us something on the side of the boundary, right? On the, on the side of the fluid domain, and that's the right-hand side, okay? And we also integrate the first equation on the boundary, okay? Now integrate the first equation on the boundary and also has a top bottom slide coming from the first term, right? So this is top and the bottom, okay? And the second one, we just keep, okay? So we just keep this, okay? Now you add these two together, right? So you can see that this is a positive term, right? And this is a positive term. And also that, so also that this term, if you add these two together, these cancel, right? Okay. And this initial data, we, we don't worry about it, right? So this initial data here, we don't worry. And this lower order term, we don't worry. So we add them together, we get control of these two positive quantities, okay? One is on the top slide and one is it's also on the top, which is on the time t, right? But on the boundary, okay? And by the boundary data, uh, by, sorry, by, by the lower order term and initial data. 
Okay. Okay, so now I want to show you why this is a low order term, right? So this is a low order term. So if this is a low, so if we, so now here, this means that if we look at this estimate, the right hand, so this F, okay, so this, so this here F, this, this guy F is a lower order term appears here, right? So this means that we need to control if, so, so if this is our little F, we need to control a quantity like this, okay? So how do we control a quantity like this? And uh, so we know that this equation satisfies, it's easy to derive this equation of this form, box equation, and this is a boundary value equals zero. So the idea is again to find appropriate multiplier vector field, okay, to derive energy estimate, okay, okay. Now here it's input. So this b plus alpha n is a time-like uh, vector field with respect to the Minkowski metric. Okay. So again, I'm going to use the model equation to illustrate idea. Okay. So we we have this equation box equation equal to g and equal to zero on the boundary. So this u, imagine this u is just dv sigma squared, right? So box u equal to g on the through the main box u equal to zero on the boundary, okay? And now we want, remember, we want to control of the integral on the boundary of this u gradient u square, okay? Okay, so the idea is we use a multiplier vector field of this form, okay? So here, now if we have, normally if we have like a box equation, right, the wave equation, very often we know that the multiplier in our elementary courses is dTU, right? So here, instead of using, so applying dTU, we will have control of a time slice at the top by the initial time and also by the lower order term, right? But that's not enough because we want to also, we, we, we really want to get control of this quantity. That means quantity on the boundary of the fluid domain, okay? To get the control of the boundary of the fluid domain, we need to tilt by a little bit, okay? In the normal direction. So this up, so this is just you experiment and you find this works, okay? So you, instead of applying DT, you just tilt it by a little bit in the uh, spatial direction. Okay, and that's the vector field. So you multiply and performing uh, standard com computation, you find you can write this in this conservation uh, conservation law, form of conservation loss, okay? So these two are low order term, it doesn't really matter. And now we integrate, okay? So integrate, so because dt give us control, so the dt part of the, the vector field give us control on the flux on the top slice precisely is this one, okay, the standard energy. And on the side, okay, by being, by tilt, tilt the vector field a little bit, we get the control on the side, and which is exactly what we want, okay. Okay, these, these derivative it, uh, is, uh, it points exactly in the normal direction because u equal to zero, okay, on the boundary, okay. u equal to zero on the boundary, okay. So together we get control of this term. Okay, and that's the roughly the idea. Okay, okay. So now this is how we. So of course there are more 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 elements involved in getting the a priori estimates. Okay, so now here I want to just spend a few minutes to discuss uh, to discuss the Newtonian limit. Okay, so now to get the Newtonian limit, we cannot just set the speed of light equal to one, right? Because this is a limit as a speed light goes to infinity. We need to let C go to infinity. So we reach, re reintroduce C into the equation, okay? So everything have to rescale back, okay? And this pressure equal to this and the density equal to that, okay? And the sound speed equal to the speed of light and then sigma square equal to C to the power four, okay? And this is what we get, okay? So, it turns out, so the, then we also have to con consider the rescaled quantities, right? So instead of V and the sigma square, these are the rescaled quantities to pass limit to, okay? So V bar equal to V divided by C and sigma bar square is this one, okay? And then we have to show these two quantities remain of, of size 
remain bounded in a positive time interval. Okay, so I have to talk about what is a positive time interval. Okay, so here we also have to rescale time, right? So the standard time variable is related to so the rescale the time is t prime is t over c. Okay, so this means that we have to control these quantities on the time scale of c times a, a, a fixed time positive time t1, which is independent of c. Okay, so in other words, the time that the, the original variable t should equal should goes to infinity as c go to infinity. Okay, and then. Of course, we can continue that. Just write down the metric and after the rescale form. So the re so so the same idea, the same proof I just described, in fact, give us a lot more, right? So by reintroduce the speed of light, okay, and we find that the a priori estimate holds on this time interval with c one independent of c. So this means that, and the energy is remains of order one as c goes to infinity. Okay, so because we have a uniform bound, then we can pass to the limit, okay? So this is a theorem. So the rescaled quantities to the free boundary problem converge to the solution of the Newtonian problem as the speed of light goes to infinity. So I think here, thank you very much for your attention.